Now let's look at the network layer switch. So just to be reminded of the protocol layers, we have physical, we have data link here, notified as MAC protocols, and then we have network link layer 3 and transport link layer 4. Here an application data unit is given to layer 4, where layer 4 adds its protocol information. That layer 4 protocol data unit is given to layer 3. And here we refer to a protocol data unit as a packet. The packet will then be forwarded down in the protocol stack to the data link layer, which add a header and usually also a trailer. And we refer to such a packet as frame. And the frame will be sent on the physical network. So now we will look at the switch between these two LANs if the switching function is done at layer 3 rather than layer 2 as before. So we have the similar structure on the input side as before. We have the physical layer which is terminating, we have a data link layer which checks frames and puts correct frames in frame buffer and of course acknowledges them back to the sender. And now the network layer starts after the data link protocol has been terminated. And we look at the functions from input to output link. So the frame comes in with this physical layer header. The data link frame is extracted with its header and tailor. And inside in the payload is a layer 3 packet. That layer 3 packet carries a layer 4 segment. And here we're interested in the information that is in the layer 3 header, the green header here. So let's look at layer 3 for the internet protocol. What does the switch architecture look like now? So to the left we have the point-to-point -point data link that is terminated with the when frames are put in the frame buffer. Those frames are then taken over to the network protocol where there's some processing going on. And this we will go through in a later module. The address lookup will be based on IP addresses here. So we need to see how IP addresses are structured, and I will show you next. But then the address lookup gives a port address that sets a demultiplexer and the write inside the switch. From the demultiplexer, the switch fabric and the buffer management is similar to what I showed for the data link switch. So the main difference of a layer 3 switch is the lookup of the addresses and the structure of the addresses. There is also some protocol processing, as I mentioned, but we ignore that for now. The IP addresses have the same function as an Ethernet address to identify a node on, an, on a network. In this case, it's an IP network, which is a network that is built to span the whole globe. So there's a common addressing scheme irrespective of what data links are used below the networking layer. It's important that each node has its distinct identity. Cannot be any confusion which node has a given IP address in the whole internet. So the IP addresses provide addressing on the network level. And for version 4 of the IP protocol, there are 32-bit unique numbers, which gives an addressability of 4.3 billion addresses. Version 6, which is increasingly being introduced, has larger addresses, 128-bit addresses, which is a huge number. It corresponds to something like 10 to the power of 38 addresses. And this was selected to never run out of addresses to allocate to, to devices. The difference between Ethernet addresses and IP addresses is that the IP addresses are assigned deliberately to ensure scalability, while the Ethernet addresses are assigned to, as hardware addresses to the devices and an address can appear anywhere in the world where it's connecting to a local air network. So L2 addresses are random assignments. You can imagine that this doesn't scale well when we start to have a global network with tens of billions of devices. So IP addresses have a structure to allow address aggregation. It means that the packets going in the same direction share most of the significant bits of their addresses and therefore a switch might only have to look up a few bits of that address in order to know in which direction the packet should be sent. IP4 addresses consist of 32 bits. I've written them here as four octets of bits. The convention is that they are written as four decimal numbers with dots between. So the first octet is interpreted as a decimal number, which is 130 here. The second octet is interpreted as 
237 in decimal, the third octet is 212 in decimal, and the fourth octet is 25 in decimal notation. This is just a convention to be able to write addresses in documents. The actual address is in the binary notation, of course. This notation is called dotted decimal notation or dot address, dot quad addresses, but the dotted decimal notation is the most common name of referring to this format. What is the structure of an IP address to allow scalability? Well, an address has two purposes. It has to uniquely identify the computer, which in internet terminology of call a host, so that's an identifier, and it has to give a location of that host in the network, so that's a locator. These are two different purposes of an address. So the address has two parts. The network prefix gives the location of the computer. And the second part, the host ID, gives the identifier of the computer within that network, which has been described by the network prefix. So you can see with these two parts, a computer is described where it belongs to, which network it belongs to, and then it has a unique identifier within that network where it can be found. How to look up an IPv4 address will be a case study in this course. So how will you know where the split is between the network part and the host ID part of an address? Originally, this was prescribed in five different classes, each indicated by the most significant bit. If the class identifier started with a zero, then the class identifier plus the network ID formed the first byte of the address, the most significant byte of the address. So there were a few such networks, there were two to the power of seven such networks, 128 networks, but they allowed to have many computers connected to that network. Class B started by one zero. So you can see there's no confusion between class A and class B because class A starts with zero and class B starts with a one. It uses the first two bytes for network ID. And since the class identifier takes two bits, there are 14 bits remaining for the network ID. And to that, you can have 2 to the power of 16 hosts connected, host addresses. Class C starts with 110, again, avoiding confusion with class B. And the remainder of the first three bytes form the network ID. And then there are two classes that have special purpose. Multicast is a group address where you can reach multiple computers. And then there's a class E, which has been reserved for future use, wondering when the future will ever arrive. So this structure made it easy to do the address lookup in a switch. If the most significant bit was 0, then the remaining 7 bits would be the key into the address table. If the most significant bit was 1, 0, then the remaining 40 bits would be the key into the lookup table. And if the first bits were 1, 1, 0, then the remaining 21 bits would be the key into the lookup table, get the port. However, this structure didn't work very well. The class A addresses is too large for most organizations. And there was no address class suitable for mid-sized organizations, where C was considered too small, B was considered too large. That meant that mid-sized organizations maybe requested a class B address, even though they didn't use it very well. So there was a fear of running out of class B addresses. To resolve this dilemma, a new structure was introduced called classless interdomain routing, CIDR. For CIDR, there are no fixed boundaries between the network and the host ID. You could have a split where the network is a small part of the address, or you could have in other words, the network ID is the major part of the address. The IP network identity is represented as a prefix. That means that we take an IP address, and then we have to know how long the prefix part, so the network ID is on that address. It can be written as follows. We have an address, 130.237.16.18, and slash 17 says that the most significant 17 bits form the network ID for this address and the remaining bits are the host ID for the address. The prefix length can take any value between 0 and 32. It's important to remark here that the split between the network part and the host ID part of the address changes for each switch in the network. In some switches, it might be sufficient to lock up just a few bits 
of an address in order to determine in which direction the packet should be sent, meaning to what port it should be sent. In other switches, the, the network ID will be longer. Ultimately, when the packet reaches the network where the host is destined, the full network ID be, will be recognized and eventually in the switches in that network the router will have to look at the full address to get the packet to the right computer that should receive the packet. A network address can be specified as an address and a bit mask. If you take, for example, the address that we had on the previous slide, for which the network ID was 70 bits long, then we can take the address, then we can mask out the 17 most significant bits. This can be done by bitwise logical AND. So look here. Here's the address in decimal dot notation, and to the right are written out each octet in its binary form. Then we take the mask, which has ones in the 17 most significant bits, and then it has zeros in the remaining least significant bits. And then if you take bitwise AND between the address and the mask, then you will get the network prefix, which can be looked up in an address table. Since any binary value taken with logical AND with one will create the value back, and any binary value logical AND with zero will create a zero, we see here that we have extracted out the 17 most significant bits of the address. And that corresponds to the network ID for this address. In summary, it's important to be able to build extended LANs because one single LAN spans a very small area and very few users. So when building an extended LAN, it's also important to isolate the traffic between the LANs. So only traffic goes from one LAN to another, which has a destination in the other LAN. The bridge learns this connectivity by looking at sender addresses at the incoming ports. This is valid also for switched local area networks, which use point-to-point -point links rather than shared links. We looked at the switch functions and architecture for layer 2 and layer 3 switches. And I show you that the architecture is very similar. In both cases, addresses will be looked up and frames will be sorted according to the output to which they are destined. The outputs are found in forwarding tables or address lookup tables. Then the frames or packets are forwarded from input to output links. There has to be buffer management to handle the case where more frames or packets arrive from output that can be sent at that moment. We also looked at the structure of IP addresses in version 4. First the class-based and then the classless interdomain routing.